good teaching, good fellowship. I appreciate the music, the singing, and the songs to sing. I'm not a singer. In our ministry, I've told people for years, if anybody ever told you they thought you ought to sing in public, maybe you, you should take, you know, maybe you should try it. If they sit next to you, they hear you singing. If nobody ever told you to, you probably ought to take their advice too. <laughs> and people have often told me, don't sing so loud. <laughs> but I love, the, I love music and I love the, I love the songs and, and to hear those things sung and the joy that's in them. Uh, the one song that we were saying there'd be no sorrow there, no more sickness, no more care. When I was in school in Pensacola, Florida, back in the dark ages, right after Noah got off the ark, uh, <laughs> I worked for 14 months in a Scamby County hospital. I was a glorified bedpan slinger, an orderly. And in 1969, when you were an orderly, that was you were a real orderly. It's not like hospitals today. And one of my jobs was I worked on the fourth floor, which is the top floor, the geriatric floor, and I worked at night, 11 to 7, so I could go to school. And one of my jobs was to, about 4 o'clock in the morning, I would go my floor and the other two floors and get the dietary sheets the next day and take them down to the cafeteria, to the, to the kitchen, which is right across the hall from the morgue. And I went to the morgue quite often, too, with dead bodies, but... One of the things I did, I'd, I'd walk down that stairwell from one floor to the next, I would sing that song. And I just got in the habit of doing it every night as I would go. There'd be no sorrow, because there was all kind of sorrow in the hospital, all kind of sickness. But what a day that'll be when our Savior will see. You know, that, that's such a, such a hope, such a joy. And that's what I get to preach to you about tonight. So we sang songs that that fit into that. Before I, I do that, I wanted to say, and I'll say this for the folks on the internet too, um, I want to tell you, you know, this afternoon, this morning rather, uh, you, you saw the congregation and friends surprise Rick and Linda with a, with a gift to honor their 25th, not just their 20th year as pastor, but the 25th anniversary of their wedding, their marriage together, and I, I performed that too. I, I enjoy performing weddings. Nobody listens, but I still... <laughs> And in our assembly, I'm marrying people now and have been for some time that I married their parents. It's a joy to marry someone and then have their parents, the kids get grown, them have kids, and then you can marry their kids. And uh, we have a young man living with us now as a college student. He's going to uh, he's gonna marry one of our young girls. I married their mom and dad. And I watched them grow up. And it's just a joy to see that and to see godly generations develop. And it's a wonderful thing to have a part in that. And you have that opportunity here. It's one of the joys of a local church uh, is to see people grow. And Rick and Linda, our grandchildren, we've enjoyed watching them grow up. When they're young, it's a great thing when grandma shows up. Grandpa, not so much, but grandma. <laughs> but when they get grown, get jobs, get out in life, you know, it's, uh, hi, grandma, nice to see you, I gotta go. And so it's not quite as big a big and exciting thing, but it is for us to, to see them like that. But I was going to share with you, um, if you wanted to be a part of, of that, um, helping with that anniversary gift, uh, if you'd like to contribute to, to it, uh, some folks said they didn't have an opportunity to do that and they would like to. Uh, so if you'd like to contribute to the anniversary gift for Rick and Linda, you still can do that. Uh, either give a check to the church and mark it for the anniversary, or you can give it to Ricky. He's in, in, in there. He'd been collecting the money before because if they put it in the church, then Rick would have seen the you know the offerings. He checks once a month, the, the bills and stuff. He would have seen it and been alerted to what it was. But there's some folks on the Internet that, that expressed a desire to help. They have a donation button on the Internet site. You can do give on, give on that. Just mark it for the anniversary gift. So I, I say that to you. So if you, it isn't too late to help if you'd like to, and they'll they'll see that the money gets to the right place for them to to take that uh, opportunity to to, to celebrate uh, for themselves. I just I tell you that it's wonderful uh, just to be able to say thank you, you know, to ministry, and you don't often often get an opportunity to do that in a real tangible way, 
And so I, I just I share that with you. First Thessalonians chapter number one. And, and by the way, Brother Dave, he sang for you a minute ago. He's he's come and sang for us and, and actually this year in our summer conference led the singing for us. Brother Marvin Taylor's done that for a number of years. And uh, Marvin's a top drawer guy and we've enjoyed his ministry. He he was in night when was this bicentennial back in the seventies, he and his brother were, were were quite well known in the uh, Southern Gospel singing circuit through the Midwest. And when the centennial back in seventeen seventy six, uh, nineteen seven nineteen seventy six, was that when it was? Uh, gosh, can you think that was that long ago? Some of you weren't even born then. <laughs> to me this is just like yesterday he did this. But he and his brother were chosen out of all the, the gospel singers in the Midwest to go and represent Southern gospel singing in New York, in, in Washington, for that. And they've had a, had a tremendous ministry. Our, our television program, Forgotten Truths, the song that begins that, Marvin wrote that song and sings it. And we've enjoyed his ministry through the years. Marvin's health has failed him, and he has congestive heart failure, and he had to retire. And Brother Dave was kind enough to be uh, stepping in his shoes, big shoes to fill. And David didn't decided he didn't want to fill Marvin's shoes. He'd wear his own. <laughs> and we appreciate that. I, I, I like people to be themselves. And uh, we enjoyed his ministry and look forward to, to it in the future. I say that to you so that you know you're welcome to come back to the Midwest, too, for our, our summer conference in, in, in July. It's beautiful weather in Chicago in July. It's not, you know, it's kind of warm here in July. Have you noticed that? All these... All these winter visitors come and they go home in the summertime. There is a reason for that. People kept telling me it's 32 degrees in Chicago today, but in July it won't be 110. <laughs> and if it gets to be 100, which it might once or twice every three or four years, the next day it probably won't be out of the 70s. So it's, it, it's good. <laughs> and... We put the conference in the latter part of July, so it's the warmest part of the year for us, so that you wouldn't feel too unfamiliar with the territory. But uh, the big thing is we have a good time in the Word. All these meetings, I travel 15 to 20 times a year in Bible conferences like this, and it's wonderful to see God's Word preached and, and loved and appreciated all over America. And from the Father's, when we're in Oregon in, in September, Two weeks later, we're in, in Portland, Maine, all the way across the United States. And there's a conference in Maine two weeks after that. And two weeks after that, I'm somewhere, somewhere else. I can't remember all right off the top of my head. We go to, go to uh, Tennessee and then the Carolinas and so on and so forth. Two, and two weeks from now, I'll be in New Orleans for Bible conference down there. I'm not the dumbest guy that's ever walked. I'm not really a smart fellow, but January for 35 years, I've gone to Florida. <laughs> February, gone to Southern California. And we've been doing that since the early 80s. I moved to Chicago in the early 80s, <laughs> 79. So, you know, it's, it's great to have that break, but just, just a little weekend like this to enjoy the fellowship around God's Word. It's just such a, such a refreshing time. You know that, and it's worth all the effort. We appreciate you being here and so many folks in so many places, and there are people that watch on the internet, and it expands the ministry out. And there's a hunger today like, like literally like never before. I had a, a note from my office today, and one of the ladies that answers the phone, and she says, you know, she identified a radio station in Ohio where we're on five days a week with daily Bible time. He said, you know, we're getting such response from that radio station, it's just overwhelming. Uh, the, the, the hunger and the response fr from that. And the same things in, 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 like down in New Orleans. We're on the radio down there five days a week and the TV program. And it's just wonderful to see the response, people's eagerness to, to hear God's Word and just enjoy it together. And I thank God for that and for the privilege of being a part of it. And you're a part of that. And uh, it, it's a great thing. He's, he didn't show you. He's got the tattoo from the from the, from the, uh, the, there he is. He, 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 he won his team's lumberjack award. Now John Verstegen won our team, but he can't show you where they put his. I'll leave that for you to wonder.
But he, he, he got the stamp too. Now he's going to have to explain to his wife how come he, he got it and why it's where it's at. <laughs> he had his wife with him, so I guess she's the one who decided where that would go. <laughs> Made a public display, okay? Father, we thank you this evening for your word. We just pray as we look at these things tonight, they might encourage and lift our hearts and spirits. We thank you for today and the time to study your word and hear it and be taught to be believed and to be taught in a way that instructs us that we too can trust and believe it. We thank you for that, the joy that it gives to our heart, the sustenance, the strength it gives, and the privilege it gives us to live day by day in ways that honor you. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remember without ceasing, remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. That expression, the patience of hope. The topic this evening is the foundation, the foundation's future. What's the future of the foundation we're built on? And that's when you build, you have to be sure you understand what we're talking about, building on the right foundation. Now, there are a lot of people build on the wrong right foundation. That is, they go back into someone else's foundation in time past and build on the prophetic program today. That's a good foundation, and it's a right foundation for Israel. It's not the right foundation for you and me. And that's what 2 Timothy 2 is about when it talks about study to show thyself approved unto God. I was reading a, 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 a magazine. It was up in Calgary back in August, and the pastor there said, said to him, Have you seen this, this, this Grace magazine? I said, Well, yeah, I know about it. He said, but have you seen it lately? And I said, well, no, I haven't. haven't. And he says, well, I want you to read this article. And I read the article, and the, the, the guy was saying in the article that 2 Timothy 2.15 doesn't tell you to study the Bible. He said, that's not, a, that's not a command to study the Bible, and it's not a command to study the Bible dispensationally. And I'm, I, I read the article, and I'm thinking, here is probably the preeminent Right Division magazine in the war in, in the world for the last part of the in, the in the last decade, and now they're saying Second Timothy two fifteen study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that is not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth doesn't really mean dispensational Bible study or that you ought to really study your Bible. And I scratched my head about that and I said, what? The passage does say study. That's exactly what it means. You know what you do when you study? You give diligent attention to the details in the text. What are you going to study? You're going to study the Word of God. You're not going to study theology. Someone was asking me this just a little while ago about a, 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 an expression. What, what was the expression? The full counsel of God? The full counsel of God. You heard that expression. That's not in the Bible. Get your concordance, look it up. You won't find the expression, the full. Where you find that is in theology books. That is an expression developed by Calvinists to express their view of the, what they call the eternal decrees of God. And the full counsel of God, everything God planned before the foundation of the world. When I was a young preacher in Alabama, um, I, I had an opportunity. I, I was sent across over into a county to preach in a little country church one Sunday. And it was a, a sum, summer day. The windows were up, breezes, the, the fans were blowing. This is in the 1960s. You know, air conditioning was something that maybe somebody had in their car, but certainly not in church buildings. You, you're supposed to sweat in church and there was a they had the, the globe lights that hang from the ceiling you've seen them and there was one right over the pulpit and I'm sitting there watching and the old deacon he's making announcements and they're leading singing and there's a wasp whoo, whoo, around that light they're drawn to the heat and the light you know how that works and the old deacon looked at me and he says, Well, Brother Jordan, before the foundation of the world, God decided that wasp was going to be, going to be to here to hear you this morning, so come bring us the word. Well, my thought was, I hope that he didn't decide before the foundation of the world that wasp was going to come down and light on me. I just hoped he had it planned him to stay up there. But that kind of, that's, that's the kind of religious foolery that you get into when you study theology instead of God's Word. When he says study, he's talking about studying God's Word to show yourself approved unto God. It has no, it doesn't make a lick of difference in the long run whether I approve you or even if your, your spouse approves you. When you face God, that's who needs to be, you have His approval. A workman that needs not to be ashamed when you get there, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. 
So what you're going to rightly divide is God's Word. That's what you're studying. That's how you study it, and that's why you study it. And when he says that rightly dividing the Word of Truth, I, I try to tell people, when you rightly divide the Word of Truth, there is no error in the Word of Truth. When you rightly divide it, you make the distinctions in the Bible that God makes, and you divide between them. The great distinction is prophecy and mystery. We'll make that division and do it correctly. He's not talking about the way that verse is usually read is that you should rightly or properly handle the Word of God. In fact, I've seen books by that name, properly handling God. That is not what the verse says. That is a translation of that verse, that an English translation that comes out of the Latin translation, the Latin Vulgate. When it says rightly dividing, you know what it says in the Greek language? Rightly dividing. It's that easy. It says, well, it doesn't say that in Greek. It says it in Greek words. Orthodomeo is a Greek word. We don't talk like that. We, we use English. So the, and the English, way you say that in English, rightly divide. That is not the idea of dividing error from truth. And that's what most people teach because they don't understand dispensational Bible study. He's not saying put error over here and truth over here. He's saying right, there's no error in the word of truth. And he goes on in that passage to, to explain a fellow who had erred concerning the truth. And what he said was that the resurrection is past. He didn't say there was no resurrection. That would be an error. That would be heresy. But the guy didn't say there was no He said there is a resurrection. It's just past. Now, if your resurrection is past, what's over with? The dispensation of grace. If the dispensation of grace is over, where are you? In the tribulation. So people were teaching, John went over it this morning in Thessalonians, there were some people teaching those folks that they were in the tribulation. To get in the tribulation, you gotta, the rapture's got to be over with. That is, a, you draw a line and you put things on the line, the timeline, and that's what dispensational Bible study is about. So when you do that, you realize that where we are today, we are looking to the future. Now I drew that little chart, that little building last night, John went over how that structure works uh, th this morning. And when you build an edifice, you edify people. You build that structure. You lay the foundation. That's Romans. Rick went over that. Then you build the structure. That's where Paul's epistles build on that foundation. The book of Ephesians does that. Then you put a roof on the building. And that's what Thessalonians does. And you get in that roof. When you have a roof on a house... One of the things you do from a roof is you can get up there and, and, and look around and see, see the, the surroundings, see what's there. A lot of times you have a little poop deck on, up on the roof, a little observation deck. So you can look around you and see what's going on. It's also there to protect you from the sun, from the elements, so that they don't get into your house and, and drain things down. The roof is sort of like the, the future. Romans gives you the orientation to grace, your foundation. Ephesians gives you the, the, the goal of why God's formed the body, the fullness of what he's doing today. And the roof, Thessalonians, the doctrine there is about the future and the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And by the way, the pastoral epistles, they look toward the godly. You know the word godliness doesn't appear except in pastoral epistles where it first shows up? People talk about we're godly. That's the activity that is produced by the life of God's Word working in His people in, the, in and through the local church. So you see the, God, the issue of godliness, that truth in, that, in the house, living in that house, and there you see the fellowship of the mystery, and the whole thing works together. The foundation's future is we're up on the roof now, and we're going to look toward what the future holds. Now understand, Israel's program has an ages to come. Our program has an ages to come. And what happens in the future is the promise and the, pro the prospect and the hope of this guy back in time past takes place out in the future. What was his prospect? Go back with me to Acts chapter 3. The goal in prophecy, Acts chapter 3, and I'm going to take the caboose and put it up close to the engine because a lot of this is some of the stuff that we talk, I talked with you about last night, some of the stuff you could teach me, 
and there's some other stuff I'd like to talk about, so I'm going to kind of condense this. In Acts chapter 3, verse 18, Peter is talking about prophecy. He says in verse 18, But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Everything that the Bible had said up to this point about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he has fulfilled it. That tells you something. That tells you that when you look for the Bible prophecy to be fulfilled, you look for it to be fulfilled literally, physically, earthly, exactly like it said. It wasn't, phys it wasn't f fulfilled metaphorically. It wasn't fulfilled allegorically. It was fulfilled literally. Okay? He when he's on the cross, John 19, it's one of the most fascinating passages. Hold your hand and just look, at, look back at John 19. John read a verse this morning. It's one of those verses that just blows my mind. Jesus says, I could call 10,000 angels. And there's a great song about that. He could have called 10,000 angels, you know, that song. He said, I could have called 10,000 angels. Don't you know my father would have sent me? I'm still in control of this thing. But if I don't go to the cross, how can the scriptures be fulfilled? You remember, you realize what he's doing, right? That he could have still gotten out of that. But if he had what God's word had said, wouldn't be accomplished. That's a fascinating thing about him. He literally trusted the word of his father that much. Here's another one of these verses. John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, watch, knowing that all things were now accomplished... Everything the scripture said about his crucifixion, his life, have now been accomplished. That the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Literally what he's doing there is he's on the cross and he's going through all the prophecies, ticking them off one at a time. And he says, every one of them has been fulfilled, but there's one that hadn't been fulfilled yet. Psalm 69. Now there was, was given, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it to his lips, put it to his lips. And when Jesus therefore, you know what that is? You go back to Psalm 69, verse 21, they, and, and the text says they're going to do that. They're going to give him the vinegar to drink. It hadn't happened yet. So he says, I thirst, so they would do exactly what that one verse that hadn't been fulfilled yet is done. That kind of, he was on the cross, he was, that, he was that much in control of his faculties. You see where it says, verse 30, Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, when he received the vinegar, he said it's finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When you bow your head, that means it's up and you let it go down. His head wasn't wallowing around kind of stuff. But a lot of that stuff you see in the pictures or the movies. He was in complete control of his faculties, mentally and physically, and he dismissed his spirit. He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and he gave up. He wouldn't have died unless he said, I die. Incomplete. And his mental faculties, thinking through the verses, one verse over there in Psalm 69 that you and I would read in Israel and read for centuries and had no idea what it meant, but he did because he wrote it. And it was about him. So Pete says in Acts 3, and by the way, Peter, after the resurrection, Christ takes his apostles away. They don't even know he's going to be resurrected. They see him. Woo! What a shock. Then he meets with them that evening, and he opens the scripture to them and begins a 40-day personal seminar with his apostles, for Acts chapter 1, teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He literally took the word of God and showed him that those, them those, these verses that explained, that's me. That's why in Acts chapter 1, Peter can quote two obtuse verses out of two obscure psalms and say that's Judas. Nobody ever reading 
the verses in John chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, it, out of the Psalms, would have recognized that to be Judas. Peter did. How? Because Christ showed him those things, taught it to him. It's fascinating. So when Pete says this, he's been thoroughly schooled by the Lord to understand all that the prophets had said. Do you remember Acts 18? They didn't understand any of it. But after the cross, he opens their eyes and unfolds to them the things that are in the prophetic scripture. So when Peter says this in Acts 3.18, he knows wherever he speaks. He says, it's all been fulfilled. The first coming, right up, Pentecost, this is that which is Joel, Joel had spoken. It's all been done. Repent you therefore, verse 19, and be converted. Now he's going to say that, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before, before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which are spoken by which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet like unto the Lord your God, uh, 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 shall your, the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Pete's saying, Hey, everything's been fulfilled in prophecy. You need to repent. Because he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to destroy people that don't follow his word. Now, if he's fulfilled all these things literally, you know what he's going to do when he comes back? He's literally going to fulfill the judgment. He's sitting at the Father's right hand at the Father's invitation. Psalm 110, verse 1, he quotes it in chapter 2. Till he makes his foes his footstool. That's an interesting verse. Psalm 110 says... Come and sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. When Peter quotes it, he adjusts that a little bit. And he says, sit at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Now an enemy is a foe and a foe is an enemy, but there's a different class. There's a little shade of difference. An enemy can be your enemy and just be looking at you across the fence. A foe is an enemy who is actively engaged in activity against you. You follow the difference in that? Pete's saying, hey, the time for him to pull the wrath out is coming. You better get right. If they were to repent, if they didn't repent, the judgment's coming. So the advice is repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when he comes back instead of him pouring his wrath out on you. But notice what he calls it, Christ's coming. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Did you ever sing that song, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings? You know that old song? I was raised on that. I was raised on a lot of goofy songs. That comes out of the book of Ezekiel. When God talks about when the kingdom comes, there are going to be these showers of blessings that he pours out on Israel, a time of refreshing. In fact, the second advent of Christ is described as, as, the, as the dew in the morning on the grass, refreshing the grass, like a rainstorm. There literally will be a rainstorm associated with it, but it's described metaphorically in other passages about the refreshing of the morning, where he's going to refresh the earth. Then verse 21, he says, Whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. You see, the future in prophecy is God is going to restore His creation back to its original intended purpose. You follow that? That's the goal of prophecy in the earth. What was God's plan for man when He put him in the earth? Do you remember? Genesis chapter 1, you, you, we need to look at that. He said, well, look at it, Genesis 1. Genesis 1 verse 28. Genesis 1, verse uh, 27. So God cr created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful. I like to point out, when he said be fruitful, they were already married. In our day, people think being fruitful without being married is, a, is sort of the norm and standard. 
In the Bible, it wasn't that way. In the Scripture, children, for the fruit of marriage, are designed to be in, in, fam in homes, two-parent homes, mom and dad, unless some tragedy comes. Parents, married couples, committed to one another, one man, one woman for one lifetime kind of thing. You understand that. They're to be fruitful. I mean, Adam and Eve are already married, you understand. They're to be fruitful. They're to have children and multiply. Now, you already got kids. So when he says multiply, he's not talking about have, you having more kids. He's talking about your kids having kids. He's talking about let's develop. Have you ever been to an Amway meeting where you got the little circle? And the, uh, let's multiply. Let's get some downlines going here. And replenish the earth. What he's talking about is developing a culture. Developing a family that passes on values and understanding to their children who pass that on to multiple children. And we're filling the earth back up with a creation. We're replenishing the earth with a creation that, on, that is, is following the image and likeness, the purpose that God has for the creation. Now he tells you what that is. To replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the, the mandate that God had, the purpose for which God created man, come back with me to Psalm chapter 8, had to do with going out and repopulating the earth with a creation, with, with creatures who are going to use the earth the way God intended it to be used. To have dominion over it. The verse we read in Colossians 1.17 last evening, that by him were all things created and for him. See, he created that universe, he created all that government in the universe and in the earth, not just created it, but he created it so that it would accomplish his purpose. Psalm 8, you know this verse, this chapter, great, great psalm. I was sitting there a minute ago, we sang that song uh, about hallelujah. Did you know the word hallelujah is not found in the Bible? He said, what? It's not. Now you didn't know that, did you? And you don't believe that, do you? But you're scared to wonder about it because you'd think I would know. Get your concordance out and look. It's not found in the word. In the Bible, it's hallelujah, no age. Now, you know, I don't get bent out of shape because we say hallelujah. We stick an H in there. Uh, the, reason, the reason that is the Greek language doesn't have an H. They have a rough breathing over the original alpha, and we say, they, they would say it with an H, but they don't have a letter H. So in your Bible, it doesn't say hallelujah. It says hallelujah. Then in all your hymn books, it says hallelujah. I was in, where was it, Prague, and I, I was in the hotel, I couldn't find anybody who spoke English. And I'm in the lobby, which is the only air-conditioned room in the, in, the, in, in the hotel. And I see a guy sitting reading the Bible. And uh, I went over to him and said, he said something to him in English. And he looked at me. No. I could see the Bible in English. I didn't know. You know what do you say? And I'm trying to say something. And he looked at me. He said, Hallelujah. <laughs> I said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's the only communication we had, but we knew those. <laughs> Psalm 8. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set the, thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. Thou hast, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy hands, thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, that's Genesis 1. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hath crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, that thou hast, thou hast put all things under his feet. That's what we just read in Genesis. But why did he do that? Verse number 2, there's an enemy out there. And man is to go out and avenge that enemy. Avenge God against that enemy. 
that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And so he put man on the earth to go out and subdue it, to go back and win it back. Because there's a rebellion taking place. And in Genesis chapter 1, those six days, what he does is he repurposes creation after it's been over, overthrown by the adversary. And he puts man there to go out and be his regent in the earth to win it back. And the purpose that God put man in the earth for was to go out and to subdue the earth and put it back under the headship of Jesus Christ. Now that purpose that God had in time past is what's going to be accomplished in the ages to come. That's what the kingdom program in the earth is all about. And that's what Peter's talking about when he talks about the, the restoration of all things. Go back to Acts chapter 1, look at verse 6. This is almost, in my mind, a comical passage. I don't know about you, but I read these things and I, I think about them, and I sometimes I get, you know, I just get ideas. In verse number 4, it says, And being assembled together, this is the, 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 the eleven apostles are with Christ. They're with, you said the end of verse 1, verse 2 that uh, the, the commandment, the, the apostles on whom he had chosen, this is who he gives the commandments to. Verse 3, to whom also, the, the apostles, he showed himself alive with many, uh, in, after his passion with many infallible proofs, being seen of them, the apostles, 40 days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, that is the apostles, commanded them, the apostles, that they should not tarry or depart rather from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John did truly baptize with water, but ye, the apostles, shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they, the apostles, therefore, were come together, they ask of him, saying. And when it says they ask of him, that wasn't a casual discussion. They literally at this point are interrogating him. It wasn't just, hey, what do you think about this, Jesus? Listen, you've been teaching us this stuff, and we see this stuff, and we get it, but Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? All this stuff you're talking about, we get it, we see it. When's it going to happen? First Peter, he said that was the question. The prophets would see this stuff. They didn't understand what they wrote about but they were given to understand that it had to do with the future. And they didn't understand what or what time it's going to be accomplished. Now these guys are getting the what. So when's the time? But notice what they ask. They inquire about, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're looking to the restoration. They're looking for the times of restitution of all things. Now, the key word in that passage to me is the word again. What kind of kingdom had Israel already had? A literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem. That's the only kind of kingdom they ever had. They didn't have a mystical, invisible, spiritual kingdom. They don't even get the Holy Spirit till Acts 2. They're not even there yet. What they had was a literal... Restore again. Are you going to restore over here the kingdom like we had it back over there? That's what they've been taught about. That's what they're looking for. The times of restitution of all. Literally in Israel's future, God is going to bring back the establishment of the authority of Jesus Christ over this planet. That's what that image in Daniel 2 we looked at last night. He comes back, destroys the Gentile world dominion. In Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kings of this world become the kings of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That's the goal of prophecy. So prophecy's foundation, properly understood, points to a future. And can I say to you, when we say we are premillennial Bible believers, that is as much a political and economic statement as it is a religious, doctrinal, theological statement. That means there is no hope for the governments of this world until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his government. And by the way, it will not be a democracy. And it won't even be a constitutional republic. It will be a 
benevolent monarchy ruled by a king of righteousness. It's a wonderful thing to think about. And he's going to bring peace on earth and goodwill and all the things people worry about. When I was coming up, everybody was worrying about nuclear war, blowing us up. Now they're, well, when I was in college, they were worrying about the world freezing. You remember the pictures on the cover of you know, the magazine and all, the globe all iced up? Global freezing. Now it's global warming. It's the same crowd, just, you know, the other side of the coin. You make money there until there's no more to make. Then you make it over here until there's no more to make. And all those things, if all that stuff happened, it wouldn't change what the real future is. That means all those things aren't going to happen. So the future of this earth is secure and it's going to be restored no matter what, no matter what mess we make out of it. And we make messes of everything we touch. I've told people for years, you know, we send men to the moon, if you believe they went to the moon. Now, now you can't even believe that. But when we sent men to the moon, what did we do? We left beer cans and cigarette butts and, and gum wrappers up there. Trash. That's expensive trash. A lunar rover, and a, you know. But they left, well, they left trash. You'll give and said, leave only footprints and take only snapshots. Well, we left footprints, garbage all over the place everywhere we went. That's what man does. We wreck things. Christ comes back and restore it all. So the future of this planet is safe in the hands of the Lord. Now, until then, do the best you can. Don't just be a pastorist and give up. Do the best you can. Be the best conservative of it you can and so forth. But understand, the best you do isn't going to be what he's going to do. Now, you and I have a future too. Go back with me to Titus chapter 2. Because this is the part that really gets me, gets me stirred up. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse number 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that something to look forward to? When I stand on the foundation of grace and I look to the future, the foundation I'm standing on doesn't just tell me look for the earthly restoration and order of things. It says look to something that's going to be the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now what that's talking about, by the way, it says the blessed hope. That word blessed means exciting, joy. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you can, on your way, grab Colossians 3 because you're going to run past that first. But look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, when he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together, where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You and I, we died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised to walk in newness of life. And then we literally ascended with him into the, to the Father's right hand. And we sit together in heavenly places. You go back to chapter 1, verse 19, 20, 21. What that's talking about is Jesus Christ sits today at the Father's right hand as, at the, at the, as the head of all principality and power. And you and I are seated there with Him. We literally share in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in the government of the heavens. What, an, what, an, what a calling! That's what God's intent, that's what God's identity, that's what the status God has given you, a rascal like us. You talk about a blessed hope. You talk, talk about a position in the family. The reason, verse 7, that in the ages to come, in the future, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He's literally got a future. The blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior has to do with him demonstrating his kindness and his grace, showing the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Colossians chapter 3. Here it is again. All that has to do, I'm reading those verses, it has to do with the fact he's going to use us in the heavenly places to honor and glorify his son. Jesus Christ is literally going to be exalted and glorified through us. Not because of you, but because of God's grace manifested in you, his kindness and grace to you is going to be put on display. Just the fact you're there is going to be a, whoa, what a deal. Colossians 3, verse 3. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ. That's Paul. You're dead, and you're alive. You, say, you know, I read that, I get whiplash. Which am I? Well, I'm both. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Whoa! For to me to live is Christ, and to die is God. I get that. That's the identity. It isn't me, it's Him. And yet it lives in me right now. So your life is hid with Christ in God. When, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with Him in glory. One day, that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. It says it that way. He's the great God and He's our Savior. He's everybody's great God, but He's only our Savior. See the why I said it that way? It's not two people. That's not one God and then Christ. That's Jesus Christ is the great God, but He's our Savior. That's the, when he appears in glory. We're going to appear with him. We call that the rapture. We call that the resurrection. That's going to be a great day. Come with me, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 14. We're in 2 talking about the salvation. He had called you by our gospel, notice, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't say, I saved you to keep you out of hell. Now, that's a good thing. And it, he does keep you out of hell. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That keeps you out of hell. And I was excited about learning that day. talked about me that song the night I got saved I did not get saved for the glory of God and the good of humanity I got saved because I didn't want to burn like a torch and fry like a sausage <laughs> I believed it was better to be hell scared than hell scorched and I'd spent months realizing I was lost and I didn't know what to do to get saved because I, I was told believing was doing something and friend, I did everything, anybody, my church, anybody else's church, my uncle's church, whatever, I did anything everybody told me to do. And none of it worked. Because working doesn't work. The night I realized it was just my resting in what he, he did, his work was what counted. I said, I'll, I'll rest in that, I'll trust that. I got saved. I got excited. Thrilled me to death. My head's bouncing off the ceiling. I went and told the youth pastor of the church I was in, oh, no, Ricky, you've already been saved. I said, no, I just got saved. Aren't you listening? The pastor said, oh, no, Ricky, you've been saved a long time. I did catechism when I was 12. My mama had a certificate in the, in the cedar chest where, you know, I was a fit member of the kingdom of God, working in the kingdom of heaven with all the privileges and rights thereof. Did you ever take catechism? Stood in front of the church, had to answer a question. I was scared to death. I learned that if you had to answer questions like that, answer for, answer early because you you know you know a few answers and they're going to ask them quick. And I was scared to death they were going to ask me a question I couldn't answer. So I got right up in the front of the line. 
Got my question, I answered it. I lost him going to hell until I heard the gospel. Big thing for me. You know what I discovered? I've been studying the Bible. What I discovered? Me getting saved, as great as it was, it's like a little footnote on page 23 of a 24 page contract. Because there was something so much bigger than what God put me in. And it wasn't just, it wasn't simply about me getting out of hell. It was about I became a part of something God was doing to exalt and honor His Son. And that little song we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. If you just look at Him, quit looking at yourself, quit looking at what you do and what you don't do and all the failures that you go through and all the misery that you produce in life. Listen, He knew all about that 2,000 years ago when He died for it. You act like it's a shock. You didn't shock him. He's been dealing with dudes like you for 6,000 years. Nothing you're going to do shock him. Nothing you're going to do that he didn't provide some redemption for it at the cross. You act like it's something special because you want it to be special. And your stuff ain't special. It's rotten. But he's special. And who he makes you in him. And when you get your eyes on, off of yourself and you put them on Him, and the way to get your eyes off yourself, because we live from day to day, circumstance to circumstance, and self gets in the way, is to look at Him. And when you look at Him, and you get enough of a vision of Him, you realize, wow, I've been looking at Him, I forgot to look at myself. That's the thing. God calls up our office and talks to Brother Keeble. The guy says, I'm going to commit suicide, and I just want to call and tell somebody. Ray says, how are you going to do it? He tells him how he's going to do it. That's the first key that it might happen. He says, well, can I talk to you for a minute before you do? He said, yeah. He takes his Bible and starts talking Bible to the guy. And they talk Bible for about 20 minutes. And Ray says, have you thought about killing yourself? The guy said, I just, I'm, I, the guy's going to kill because that's all he can think about. And Ray says, have you been, have you, in the last 20 minutes, have you been thinking about killing yourself? He's, he said, no. He said, why not? Because we've been talking Bible. He says, is there an answer for that in you, for you in that? You don't want to think about killing yourself. Maybe you ought to start reading Romans. He said, it won't work. Well, how do you know? See, if you'd have done it, you'd know if it, that it worked. John mentioned this morning, you just read Paul's. Did you know you could read Paul's epistles through in 29 days if you read three chapters a day? 37 chapters in Paul's epistles, divide that by three, you get 29 days. Every month you could read Paul's epistles one into the other. Now you're too lazy to do that, too busy and too self-absorbed to do it. But if you did it, in six months you wouldn't even know yourself. Dude, she'd, think, you should, she'd swear she'd marry to a different guy. Yeah, I'm not, okay, now she's telling you to do it. See that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll leave that between y'all. <laughs> I'm honest, honest. Listen, God's Word works, and it doesn't take forever. When it says the Word of God is quick and powerful, that word quick means alive, but it doesn't mean alive. It means quick. I go to the hospital and see somebody that's near death, and they're not quick. They're alive, but they're not quick. The older I get, I'm still alive, but I'm not quick. <laughs> that word's says quick because God's word is not just alive and slow to act it will get the job done and doesn't take forever if you believe it because it's got life it's power it's got a dynamic in it and it does work and no matter how far into things the slavery of life and the habituation of sin you've become it brings you it brings the liberty that God's given you in Christ into your life when you believe it and you can't believe it unless you, unless you read it and take it in. They received the Word of God, and because they received the Word of God, they believed the Word of God they received of Paul as it was the Word of God, and it effectually worked in them that believed. But they received it first. You change your life just by doing that. And by the way, if you're a dog slow reader, you could read three chapters in about 30 minutes, so just turn the news off tonight, tomorrow night. That stuff don't make it, all that stuff does make you mad anyway. I don't care if you watch Fox, MSNBC, both of them make you mad. Whichever one you like. And you just get mad. You know, and you know what getting mad does? All it does is hurt your dog. You, 
you know, you wind up kicking the dog off the couch or something. Didn't make you read Paul's epistles. Just read three chapters. Just try it. And you know what it'll do? It'll make a difference in your life for eternity that you'll like. Your flesh might not like it, but your heart will. Now, we'll go back here. Look what he called you to, verse 14. Not just, more than just keeping you out of hell, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that what's going to happen to you in the resurrection is you're going to share in the glorification of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places? That's your future. Look at Philippians chapter 1. I'm convinced that people miss this verse because they get caught in the first half of it and miss the second half, and the second half is the, per is the issue. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence, we also, whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like in His glorious body. And we stop there because we think, we're going to get rid of this old carcass and get one like His. Glory! Woo! Hallelujah! That is going to be a wonderful day, isn't it? The old preacher said, no more baldness, no more bifocals, no more bridge work, no more bulges, and no more bunions. And the older you get, the more you think, ah, what a day that's going to be. <laughs> now, when you're young, you know, you look at yourself and you say, man, I'm okay. Hey, give yourself a little time. I look around the room here. You, most of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that isn't what that verse, that verse doesn't stop there. You're going to get a body fashioned like in his glorious body, not just to get you out of a tough time. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What do you think those all things are? That is all things that we've been reading about in Colossians and Ephesians. You're going to get a glorified body, a new body, fashioned. He took the dust of the earth and fast formed Adam a body that was of the earth earthy so he could function in the earth. He's going to fashion you a body. whereby you're going to be able to subdue all those positions in the heavenly places. You're going to be given a body that is equipped and adequate to function in the glorification and exaltation of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. See, it's more than just keeping you out of hell, and it's more than just keeping you out of a bunch of misery. You're going to be sharing the glorification of His Son. That's your future. Now go back with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And get 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time, so here we are in the present time, but now, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be ages to come revealed in us. See that? Present time, ages to come. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. So what's the hope? What's the earnest expectation of the creature? told you, verse 19, the manifestation of the sons of God. By the way, that's a great definition of hope. The earnest expectation. Our manifestation. Because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We're going to appear with Him in glory. And he's going to take all that stuff out of the way. And he's going to just exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and his purposes. And that manifest, our manifestation, he's going to show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. That's what the future holds for us. Now, we live in the nasty now and now. So verse 22, he says, For we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. 
Not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So what we're waiting on is getting out of here with the resurrection. And when the resurrection takes place, you're going to get that new glorified body, fashioned like His glorious body, that can, that can go up there and subdue all the things in the heavens and manifest His will, His glory, His purpose there. Now, we think of the hope as the rapture. The rapture begins the hope. The, actually, the rapture is called the day of redemption. That's what verse 23 is, the redemption of your body. The day of Christ is that exaltation out, out there in the ages to come. Sometimes people question whether the rapture, the timing of the rapture is a part of our hope. Well, if it's our hope, and it's in the other people's hope, it's not, in other words, if you take our hope and put it in Israel's hope program, then it, it doesn't work. The, rap, the timing of the rapture, that's that thing in Second in, in Timothy. He said, they said the resurrection's past. Well, then the timing of your resurrection does matter. You can't say it's past if, it's, if it hadn't happened. But the issue isn't just the timing. The issue is where you're going and what you're going to be doing when you get there. Because the what the rapture does, what the resurrection is, it concludes the dispensation of grace. Prophecy starts back here, and our con the conclusion, the culmination of our salvation is in the heavens. So your future, what you're doing as you walk by every day, is that's what you're waiting on. And the reason the idea of a pre-trib rapture, pre-prophecy rapture is important, is that you can have the proper, earnest expectation. We're to look... See, our attitude about the resurrection, about the rapture, is we're to be looking for it. And if you don't think it's going to happen for another seven years, it's hard to look for it. Look over with me at chapter 13, Romans 13. Romans 13, verse number 11. And that, that knowing that the time, that now, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, what? Nearer than when we believe. Then when you think about the rapture, what should you think about it being? Nearer than yesterday. Okay. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Now, the attitude that we should have, or he's saying to have, is that it, if something is far spent, it's, it, it's basically over with. This is not date setting. It's just saying, hey, my attitude about what, what's coming, my expectation about what's coming, is that we've already lived, the day is far spent. Have you ever far spent something? You know, you go to the mall, and you go, and you got so much money to spend, and you come home and say, I far spent today. That means you spent it all and a little more. The day has gone on longer than we expected it to. You follow that? That's the way we're to think about the dispensation of grace, amazed that it's gone on this long. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Here's a passage that gets really misunderstood. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. But this I say, brethren, that the time is short. Now, when something is short... You go up to the counter and you're going to pay your bill and, and you say, uh-oh, I'm short. What does that mean? I don't have enough money. If the time is short, that means it's limited. It's not exhausted. It's limited. It's passed away. When it talks about the time, verse, look back at verse 26. 
I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. Paul's giving advice about marriage, and he talks about marriage in connection with the present distress. Now, the way that verse is often taught is that while they were going through some really bad times right then, and so during the really bad times they were going through at Corinth, these things ought to apply. And later on when things settle down, they don't apply. But you know, I got to thinking about that. That really is not what he's talking about. We just read the verse over there in Romans. I reckon that the sufferings of this what? Present time. What's that? That's the dispensation of grace. Doesn't 2 Timothy 3, 1 say that in the latter times of the dispensation of grace, the last days, perilous times shall come? You know what the nature of the dispensation of grace is? The present distress. He's not. And by the way, there wasn't any really bad distress going on when Paul wrote Corinthians. He's not talking about standing up against persecution. He's standing up, John went over, talking about standing up against worldliness. The present distress is, that's the nature of the dispensation. And in the dispensation of grace, time short. In other words, the attitude, the natural attitude of the nature of the dispensation we live in is distress, and the time we're living in is limited. That's where you get the concept of a perhaps today. Perhaps today. If not today, perhaps tomorrow. Can you imagine the magnitude of the grace of God that's extended that day of grace one more day to reach you? And if you get up tomorrow, it's another day of grace. It's another opportunity of grace. Go back with me, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians 2. I think that Somebody says, Brother Rick, is there a verse in the Bible that teaches a pre-trib rapture? I just think I read a few of them to you. But here's one that, that fascinates me. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. In the first 12 verses, he talks about the Antichrist. He talks about the seventh week of Daniel. He talks about what we call the tribulation. Verse 3, he says... Uh, for that day should not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The man of sin, the son of perdition, that's the two, that's the, the two sections of the Antichrist ministry in the, in the tribulation. Verse number 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. You see that wicked is a capital W, that's his name, that's the Antichrist. What's he going to do? Verse, verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing them himself to be God. That's the Antichrist. That takes place. That's the abomination that makes the desolate that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24 that stands in the holy place. That's the Antichrist. That's the seventh week of Daniel Paul's talking about. Then he comes to verse 13, and he says, But, now th I'm going to change the subject. All that's true, but we are bound to give thanks to all way, brethren, to, for, to God for you, because, beloved of, of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, to sanctification of the, of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto He called you by our gospel. Now look at that verse carefully, because theology gets you screwed up here. God, from the beginning, has called you to salvation. Oh, there's my verse. I got God calling me before the foundation, of, before the beginning, before the foundation of the world, the eternal decrees, calling me to salvation. That's the only verse in the Bible that says God ever called anybody to salvation. You know that? No other verse in the Bible says He called you to salvation. But did you notice there's some words here you need to carefully look at? Beginning of what? From what beginning did He call them? Well, you could say in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That'd be a beginning. In the beginning there was the Word. There's a beginning. Philippians 4.15, he says, uh, he talks to the Philippians, he said, no church communicate with me concerning giving and giving. 
But you, from the beginning of the gospel in Macedonia, there's a beginning. I wonder what beginning it is. Well, look, look at what salvation, look, look at verse 14. When to he called you by our gospel. Was there a time when Paul's gospel was not preached? Was there a time when Paul's gospel began to be preached? So the calling in verse 13 is calling some people by Paul's gospel. I would suggest to you that the beginning there is from the beginning of the time Paul's gospel began to be preached. Follow that? In other words, from the beginning of the dispensation of grace. God called the body of Christ to salvation. But what salvation? Salvation from what? 1 Timothy, he says that a woman will be saved in childbearing. You think that's saved from hell? You've got to be saved from hell by having a kid? Fellas, you're in trouble. <laughs> no. 1 Timothy 4, he says that to Timothy, the pastor, he says, if you are faithful in these things, You'll save yourself and them that hear you. You think you get saved? No, that's saved from what? From the apostasy in, in the first two verses of that chapter. Salvation has a context. What's he talking about them getting saved from here? All that stuff back in verse 3, 4, 5. You want to be saved from the beginning of the dispensation of grace. God has chosen to save the body of Christ from the tribulation period. You're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9 and 10. That's why verse 14 says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. From the very beginning of the dispensation of grace, God has intended for the body of Christ not to be a part of Israel's program, but to be taken out and taken into the heavens and demonstrate the exaltation of Jesus Christ there. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. You have to maintain that truth to be faithful. Now, Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us. Isn't that wonderful? And hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you and every good word and work. He loved us. God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, God's love is not tied to, in your life and to what you do. God's love is not tied to your, your, your finances, not tied to your health. It's not manifest by your love life. It's manifest by one event in human history, and that's the cross work. Now, when you look for God's demonstration of his love to you, anywhere else you're going to be disappointed. But you look there and you'll be, you'll be assured. So now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who hath loved us. Here in his love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's real love. And God the Father loved you. And hath given us an everlasting consolation. Isn't that wonderful? You've got a con every problem you face in life today, you've got a consolation in Jesus Christ. One of Job's miserable comforters looked at him and says, Job, are the consolations of God too small for you? Don't let them be for you. And good hope. You've got a future, folks. Understanding what it is helps you to appreciate it. And the more you understand about it, the more you can appreciate it. But you know, when I read those verses, when I was a kid, we used to sing a song, Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. That's it. And every day you walk with him, and every day you look full in his wonderful face, and the way you do that is you look, you've heard it today over and over, you look fully into that book. That's why you want to learn to rightly divide it. Not to prove yourself right and somebody else wrong, but to be able to see him, understand his thinking, and how that live in your life. And let, by reason of use, that gives you discernment to walk in the circumstances of life 
in a way that honors him. All these people out in religion out there are searching in all the wrong places for what is available in Jesus Christ. It's such a sad thing. They're searching in thousands of experiences and things that are so much smaller than he is. Sometimes it's the world. Sometimes it's religion. But it's all tiny compared to him. He's where the, where the life is. And the good thing is that the life we have in him, no matter how dumb you think you are now, <laughs> it's going to be wonderful out there. And when you look at that future, I came by, we are riding down the freeway, the big sign, $197 million for the lottery. And I go, nah, somebody's going to win because I'm not going to win it because I didn't play it. God told me one time, he says, ah, oh, I don't want to hear about that stuff about when I go. I'm having a hard enough time getting by it through the day. I can't worry about the future. And I thought, if you won the lottery, first question they ask you, what would you do? Well, I just wouldn't change. You lying rascal. <laughs> you know you would change. Said, I think I, I don't think I'll quit my job. Yeah, you would. You, you'd, you know. You'd sing nine to five to your boss tomorrow on the phone. <laughs> but, you know, if you won the lottery, it would make a difference about how you looked at today because you know your future is absolutely, totally financially secure. When you know your future is absolutely, totally eternally secure, it does make a difference how you look at today. Go sing that song, will you? Every day with Jesus. And it becomes sweeter than the day before. Because he is. So the foundation's future is in the end. It's nothing but glory. That's your, ever, that's your everlasting consolation and good hope. Is that in the end is just glory for me. Homer Roderhaven, Billy Sunday's song leader, that was his theme song. Oh, that will be glory for me glory for me. Oh, when at the last my Savior I see, oh, that will be glory for me. Did you ever hear him sing that? On his face. That will be glory. Yeah. We sing it, oh, that will be glory for me. He sang it, oh, that will be, you know. We'd sing it five times before he got through it once. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace and for a blessed hope. Thank you for the day. These dear saints that have worked so hard to make the hospitality so enjoyable for the ministry of your word, for folks that come with hearts that want to hear it. And we just pray that we've built into our hearts things, into our lives things, and our understanding things, into the ministry here things that don't simply sustain us day by day, but that honor you so that in eternity the honor and glory will be nothing but yours. And we thank you that your love makes every day greater and greater, more and more, and that as we rest in it, it's something that just brings comfort and consolation and strength to us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.